me. Okay. Uh, you got it over there? You see it? Okay. Excellent. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm going to try to tell you the story. Okay. I, I don't know how long, how well we'll do because it's not just about, you know, I, I'm a bug chaser. Okay. I, I, I chase bugs and I'm very lucky that I get paid to chase bugs all over the place. But we also, you know, it's the other one society. So we'll also be talking a little bit about the birds and we'll be talking about mosquitoes because everybody does that. And, and this is a way, so we, we have a minimum of a three prong approach to understand what's happening with bring conservation home, okay? Uh, but before we go any further, of course, I need to say that, uh, you know, yeah, um, yeah, I'm a buck chaser. And as, as, as Sasha's sense of humor says that I'm, 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 a, I'm a somewhat oh, of a statistician, mathematician on the weekends, especially I've had a couple tequilas, you know, you, you really can think extensively in math terms, but as you can see here, uh, so Sasha, he, so, uh, sorry, Sasha is the one that is doing a lot of the birds. Uh, Nina is doing uh, the bulk of the bees and Trey is doing the bulk of the mosquito work. Uh, besides that, of course, uh, you probably have interacted with uh, Nikki, you know, Dr. Nicole miller Struckman from Webster, who's doing a lot of our, you know, uh, citizen science, you know, community conservation uh, science along with Nina. And uh, towards the end, we'll talk about a little bit about the human aspect. And that's in collaboration with Dr. Lars Warren from uh, OMSOL, who is doing the social networking aspects of the research. And needless to say, a lot of the funding you know, uh, you know, you guys provide the people and the location and whatnot. Uh, East, Way, East West Gateway Council of Governments have provided tremendous amounts of data in terms of remote sense data and, and high resolution data uh, as well. And then the funding coming from the Missouri Department of Conservation and the Living Earth Collaborative at WashU. Okay, so... Let, let's get started and talk first about seedings, you know. Um, so this is the snapshot I took of the world population counter this morning. So as you can see, we are approaching 8 billion people. We'll probably hit that sometime in late fall, early winter. And, you know, by 2010 already, half of the people in the world, you know, lived in a city, you know, and right now we are approaching 60% of that 8 billion people living in a city. Well, give it, what, another uh, 29 years or so, and by the middle of the century, we will be hitting somewhere in the ballpark of 10 billion people in the planet. And as you can see, by that time, two out of every three people in the planet will be living in a city. The implication, the consequences of that kind of population growth and migration is that, uh, oh, one more thing, and the distribution on how those people are occurring is not even, okay? This is not evenly distributed. You can see you got places like Lagos, Nigeria, in which you're adding 85 people per hour to the city population, okay? And you get people like Delhi, places like Delhi, 79, you know, Jakarta, 29, so on and so forth. That is very, very different from the situation we observe in many of the so-called, you know, uh, Rust Belt cities like St. Louis, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and we'll get to that in a second. But the implication is that if you are going to add two more billion people to the planet, and the bulk of all that people 
will be living in a city is that the total urban infrastructure in the entire planet must double in the next 30 years. That essentially becomes a larger threat to biodiversity than climate change. So right now, urbanization, the expansion of urban areas is probably is becoming the largest threat to biodiversity worldwide. Okay. And it comes in two shapes. The first type of threat, the, 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 the first consequence of this massive expansion is what we call the urban sprawl, which is the unrestricted growth of urban areas uh, without any regard to planning. So there's no rhyme or reason, there's no logic. We are putting housing developments and we're putting mini malls in places where there shouldn't be. And as you can see, you, we are consuming huge amounts of space with very little population density. The consequence of that and the consequence to what we'll be talking about today is that in many cities, depending where you are and regulations or not, it means that 40 to at times 70% of the urban green space is owned by individual homeowners. That's a huge chunk of land considering that lawn is the largest agricultural product in the United States. In the St. Louis general metro area, the urban population has, the, the total population of the metro area has grown less than 77% in the last 20 years, yet the total amount of urban, suburban, exurban area has grown by 22%. So it means that less people are occupying greater and greater amounts of land. The second consequence of this large urban sprawl is what we call landscape homogenization, which is the increased similarity between human dominated landscapes. I mean, and you don't need to think about this in, in, in biological terms or biodiversity terms, you can think of these like when you're driving, you know, anywhere. You know, the moment pop restaurant is gone, what do you have? Everywhere you go, you have McDonald's, you have Olive Garden, and you have, you know, the same box stores over and over. It doesn't matter which part of the world you are, in the, which part of the country you are, there's always a McDonald's nearby, there's always... So you get to eat the same stuff and you get, you know, you, there, there is that sense of familiarity, yet the signature flavors and the signature, you know, uniqueness of that location disappear. Well, the, the same happens if everybody goes to Home Depot, everybody goes to the same store and you buy the same plants, you know, regardless of climate, regardless of soil, you know, you end up with the same lawn. So what you're forced then to water or to amend the soil so everybody can have the same set of plants. Okay? So that leads to what we call biological homogenization. So what do we have when you combine all these various things? This is a, a, a newer concept that has emerged in the last decade, these were called novel ecosystems. These are places that we humans have created intentionally or unintentionally in which we are bringing plants and animals and microbes and soils from totally different parts of the world. They're all coming together. All these organisms have never encountered each other ever throughout you know, hundreds of millions of evolutionary history. So they're tossing them together. You, know, you think about them like putting them in a bag, you shake it really hard, you toss it in the ground and you see what establishes. Well, some things work better with others and sooner or later, you know, they, they 
kind of emerged, something works. And that combination of plants and animals and microbes that work in that location, it's a novel ecosystem. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about two extremes of those ecosystems. There's what we call the intentional ecosystem, okay? So regardless of you being in Phoenix or being in Canada or Mexico or Argentina, you know, you have something that looks like that. Well, that requires, it's extremely hard. You know, it takes a lot of time and effort and energy to maintain a lawn with just one species. Nature, nature is very diverse, you know, and you'll have dandelions, you're gonna have weeds trying to invade. It's extremely hard to maintain only one species and it requires a lot of chemicals, a lot of energy, so on and so forth. Alternatively, we have tied a lot of our sense of uh, uh, aesthetics and to that point, uh, things like property values to that one species. So it tends to have high appeal, okay? On the other end of the spectrum of this novel ecosystem is the completely unintentional ecosystem that tends to have much higher diversity and essentially doesn't require anything. It, what, what it requires is that hands off, okay? And it has very low appeal, but in general, it tends to have much higher diversity. It persists, comes back year in, year out. The same weeds come back. Some of them are very pretty and they provide food for our pollinators and food for our you know, herbivores and our predators. So the question is, of course, can we strike some kind of balance between the two of them? Okay. So let's put this kind of like in a, spatial implicit area in which, you know, in natural areas, the human influence is small, but in, there, there's some. In rural, of course, it's significantly higher. And in the urban, it's significantly much greater. And in general, you know, when you look at things like, you know, your mammals and your birds and your plants, you have a significant decrease in diversity. You know, and not only that, but if you think, you know, what are the mammals that you encounter in St. Louis? You know, you got raccoon, you got possum, you got squirrel, you got bunny. Well, what are the mammals that you have in Cleveland? You have raccoon, you have possum, you got bunny, you got squirrel. And what are the mammals you got in Chicago? You have raccoon, you got possum, you got squirrel, you got bunny. So that's what that homogenization is, okay? So you have two effects. One is the decrease in species, and the only species you have are very very hardy, very generalistic, very, you know, they can take a licking and keep on ticking. The same with the birds, the same with the trees and the plants, okay? What we found, of course, is that for bees, that's not the case, okay? The original idea is that they were insensitive to that aspect, but we realized that's not the case. That is much more like these that in rural and suburban areas, the uh, bee diversity gets depressed, but then once you get into the core of cities, it's comparable to what you observe in natural areas, okay? So that, that's a story for another day, but we'll look about in the front. But that has led to a very serious rethinking and reimagining of biodiversity in cities, okay? We now know there are groups in, in group of animals and certain kinds of plants and in, you know, certain, you know, spiders, ground spiders and whatnot that are capable of living in cities and that can have very significant impact, not just within the cities, but what we call the regional species pool, the regional biodiversity. And there's a lot of talk about these and you guys are part of that talk, okay? So where do we come in, okay? Well, we are interested, as you can see, that there is this process that we call human facilitation. Okay? And it starts in this aspect here, lawn care and planting decisions, you know, mowing, fertilizing, uh, pesticides, okay? And these, all these, of course, in 
leads to increase in floral diversity and floral resources, as well as nesting sites. I just don't have it here. And that leads to increase in the targeted uh, sites, diversity, bee diversity going up. That leads to a citywide bee diversity increase that can then enhance or, or empower people to have further interventions. Okay. And what do we mean by intervention? Exactly what you guys are doing. Okay. And here is the poster child for intervention access, which is Doc Talamy, who has been championing, you know, aspects of bring nature home, bring conservation home programs throughout the nature, throughout the, the nation. And we're finally being able to do that. Now, uh, so Nina uh, and uh, one of my undergrads in my lab, Cody, have been working very hard to identify all sort of programs like Bring Conservation Home. We are up to about 105, 106 of these programs that we actually have data for. So we're working on that manuscript and hopefully uh, Nina will be presenting some of that pretty soon. Uh, uh, of course, the idea of any and all of those programs is to go from something like that to something like this. The question is, how do you do it? How do you accomplish it? Okay. The advantage, of course, is that Bring Conservation Home is not just a participation trophy. Lots of all these other programs, you have some kind of pledge, you sign a form, you send your check, you get a plaque, but nothing happens in between. So many people would, you know, if we ask people to take that pledge and tell me, well, what do you mean by doing, you know, plant native species? Well, if you grab one black eye Susan and put it in the ground, you planted a native species. So there is no quantitative analysis of what's going on. So that's when being, Bring Conservation Home basically takes it to a whole other level. And as you will see here, so this is in the olden days when there are about 1,700 people. I think that that number has been shattered somewhere. Uh, but in general, we have a spread of about 150 kilometers east to west and about 120 kilometers north to south, that gives me a way to basically get representative areas from all the major five ecoregions in, in, in the metroplex, which then allows me to do further analysis. From there, if you guys remember a couple years back, we sent this survey and we sent it to about 1150 uh, uh, participants at the time of which 488 people responded. Okay. And of that 387 completed survey and is from that pool of 387 that we selected people to participate in each of the individual projects. Okay. And, you know, this is kind of like a good thing. Yeah, we are preaching to the choir. Uh, so in a sense, it's a great uh, thing to have that. Uh, the problem is we don't have an actual negative control to a study. We have a positive control, which are the people that responded and have not been certified, but we, we still need that extra oomph that we're working on to, to try to uh, visit some people's yards that are not interested in this. We just need to see what's happening in those yards. Okay. So here's the, the smaller sample set. So the next thing we did is we needed to identify what kind of environmental conditions, human environmental conditions, what kind of urbanization quality do you have in your neighborhood for, for that, we incorporated a whole host of quantitative and remote uh, sense data. Uh, some of these came from 
East-West Gateway Council of Governments. So we can see, you know, do you have live in a neighborhood that has a lot of nightlight radiance, or do you live in a neighborhood that has lower housing density? What combination of these parameters was your house, you know, your house contained? And we can do that and then create a gradient that went from extremely urban to extremely rural. So the question is, you know, is BCH effective, you know? And if so, how is it effective? How is that this combination of values results in positive growth in biodiversity? And also here's the part that is, is really interesting for us. How is that the requirements that you make in terms of planting natives and removing exotics and so on and so forth, results in the interaction of all the various components. And finally, how much should programs like BCH expand to the point that then the city is not a long, no longer a sink, but it's a source, especially for pollinators and especially for our surrounding <coughs> agricultural regions. So that, that, and how do we get there? <clears throat> so let's talk about birds. Needless to say, urbanization, it's a major threat to a lot of birds. <coughs> oh, Christ. <coughs> and, and not only that, but there are certain birds that are what you call very urban tolerant. Okay, so you can see here, we can talk about, you know, oh, I go to this house, I get two, four birds, and I go to this house, and I also get four birds. So their diversity is comparable. Alternatively, we know that there are certain birds, you know, definitely a dove, yeah. And, <clears throat> but you can see the starlings. There are certain birds that are extremely, extremely tolerant to urbanization, okay? So not only do, are we looking at does the diversity between the two of them change, okay, or not, but also how tolerant the birds that you have in your yard are to that combination of urbanization parameters that we have measured, okay? <clears throat> so for this part of the study, we used 63 houses. These were the ones that Sasha were visiting. And as you can see, there's a combination at each level in which we call urban, suburban, and exurban. So exurban is kind of comparable to rural almost. And in order, you know, we realized that between the gold and the platinum, we were not finding any significant difference at this scale. So we lump them together. And uh, we use audio moth recorders. And I don't know, people may remember, Sasha, this is the first year of the pandemic where we were putting, you know, she would put the AD recorders in, you know, out in the people's backyards. These were done between June 1st and July 1st, which is the period where we get the greatest amount of resident and migrant birds, you know, in people's yards. And, uh, oops. Yeah, the recorders uh, recorded at dusk and at night and at dawn. Uh, for one minute at a time, every 10 minutes, that resulted in almost 3,000 hours of recordings. And so before we can even do any kind of analysis, uh, this is, you know, you can see here, this is like one minute of recording. So as you can see, we have 177,000 of these one minute recordings. And each one minute recording contains a very large amount of data 
because that one minute recording contains, of course, what we're interested, the biophony, which are the birds and the cricket chirping and the frogs calling. That's the data we are interested in, but also contain things like, you know, wind and water and whatnot. And it also contains, you know, the cars that were driving and the sirens that were going around and your neighbors playing music, so on and so forth. So we need to extract everything from there, just have this biophony component, okay? That then goes through something called a convolutional neural network. And eventually that generates then, it basically pulls out individual bird recordings, okay? So it's this last part that we're very interested in. Tonight, I'm only gonna, instead of talking about the entire soundscape, nature soundscape, we're going to just concentrate on individual birds. Okay. The individual bird call then gets put through the Cornell Bird Lab, uh, bird identification AI software that gives you the probability, oh, that call is that one bird, okay? So here's that one recording. And as you can see, you know, ah, he's a robin, of course. But you, at times you have to be a little bit careful because, you know, it can give you also some false positives. So for example, here's a Eurasian black cap, which definitely was not the bird <laughs> that was there. So we need to, uh, even after we do all this computational stuff, there is no substitution for the human ear. So every time we have ties, Sasha and her student has to sit down and listen to the actual recording, make sure that you do have a robin and not an Eurasian black cat. So back to the science here. So it says that, uh, that generally species are the most urban tolerant birds. And so this is one of our results of all that. So this is the Carolina wren, which is one of the most generalist birds that we have here. But as you can see here in this graph, based upon people's recordings in backyards, so these are areas that are most rural and here are the areas that are most urban, the, the houses that were most urban. And as you can see here, the Carolina wren has, is decreasing significantly towards our urban areas. So this is just one species, don't, don't dis despair. Uh, we're still going, this requires huge amounts of computational power just to get it to the point that is analyzable. So ask me again next year or ask Sasha, she'll have a much fuller picture concerning the birds. So let's move on to the bees, which is, you know, my wheelhouse. So we uh, worldwide, we have about 24,000 different species of birds, about 4,200 in North America. Uh, when it comes to Missouri, we have an ex exceedingly great knowledge. We have 454, we're keeping specific counts, okay? And we have 209 in the city. So I mean, the city and the city is defined by the 270, you know, uh, corridor, the, two, the 270 loop and the river. So it's a very, very small area, about zero point, about what, one third, 1% 1 of the area on the state. But we have 209 of the 454 species. So we, we host over 45% of the species in the state. And as you can see here, each year, we're still adding one or two more species. Okay. And there's a huge diversity of bees. We have very small bees, like the, uh, you know, like the, the small carpenter bees or some of the sweat bees, all the way to the very large carpenter bees. Okay. So for this study, we had 45 homes following the exact same rule of you know, urban versus suburban versus exurban. And again, not certified silver. And once more, we combine platinum and gold. 
of course, this is Nina's work. Uh, I have gone with her a few times, but the general idea, we only net, we do hand netting. Uh, then all of the bees that were collected in that day were sorted, labeled, identified, and then taken to specific, you know, levels and, you know, all of those bees have their catalog numbers and they're in the lab, you know, having a party. Okay, so the fact that we have a very specific and time method of collecting bees allow us to have a proxy, a pretty decent proxy in terms of, you know, the abundance of bees. So we can have an idea of abundance of bees. So we can then go back and you can see here, here's the plant diversity we know and this specifically refers to the flowering plant diversity, okay? So no grasses, not, no, none of the big trees that are being pollinated. So this is the stuff that is insect pollinated. Okay? So you can see here, needless to say, uh, homes that have uh, uh, not certified have significantly less diversity than those that are silver, and as you can see here, the gold and platinum, these are lump. No doubt that then that leads to a spread in the variance, but the average is about the same, okay? But we know that in general, you know, homes that tend to be uh, gold and platinum certified tend to have slightly higher, you know, floral diversity, okay? So let's look then at bee abundances. Are the bees responding to that plant, that increase in plant diversity? Well, in the urban areas, yeah, kind of maybe, who knows? You can see that there is like a general trend, but when it comes to the gold and platinum, you see this massive spread over here. So we think that has to deal with the fact that, you know, you can achieve, you know, gold and platinum by, by increasing diversity in, in, a, in a broad range of plants. Remember that not all plants are flowering plants that are bee pollinated. You have plants that are bird pollinated. You have plants that are wind pollinated. You have plants that are water pollinated. So th there's a broad range of pollination syndromes out there. And bees is just one of many of those. Okay. But that's in the city. These are the very urban sites. Okay. When you go to the suburban sites, yes, notice significant spread. But is that the entire, even though you have significant effect, everything is depressed. And this is extremely consistent with not only previous data from studies in my lab, but also from data from Cleveland, data from uh, California, data from Denver, in which suburban sites, you tend to have relative, you tend to have larger lawns that tend to be heavily dominated by, you know, traditional you know, non grasses, and it's in the in the suburban sites that people tend to use more fertilizers. You tend to use more pesticide, and the biggest effect. Notice that now is then the exurban sites, where you do have the biggest bank for the buck in terms of abundance. Okay, so this is not different kinds, just total numbers, which is also important. For pollination. Okay. So now let's look at diversity. Okay. So now here are the number of individual bees. So when I catch a bee, I have it in the net. So that is what that number in the x axis represents. And the question I pose here in the species diversity when I catch a new bee, so I, I, I have bee number 200 and I catch 201. And I come and I say, well, is this the same bee that I have a species I already have here or not? 
If it is a new species, you add it. If it is not, you stay the same. Okay. So that says this, this slope, this dash line here represents like how much effort do you need to put in order to catch a new bee that you have not seen before based upon what you have collected before. Well, in the urban areas, notice that it doesn't matter much. It, it really all goes down, goes the same. In that now silver, so if you're certified, you do, you're gonna have a little bit more bees if you're certified, a little bit more diversity than if you're not certified. Alternatively, in the suburban, doesn't matter. In the suburban sites, you, you can work your, your ass off and you're not gonna gain that many species, okay? And finally, where is that bring conservation home is getting the biggest bang for the buck? In the periphery, okay? So that's where the biggest, you can see that big spread. So now is the, the, the homes that are not certified really it doesn't matter how much I sample in those homes. I'm not going to gain any new species, hardly ever. But a little bit of effort in, in, in look at the silver, a little bit of effort pays big. And if you go from there to gold or platinum, wow, you really gain big time. Okay. So what do we think is happening? Ah. Well, if you're in the urban sites, the homes are relatively close to each other. There's a lot of spillover effect, okay? And many homes, even the ones that are not certified, you know, you tend to have, people tend to have a lot of flowers. The, the yards are not small, not that big. And in general, there tends to be less use of pesticides and, and fertilizers, you know, so on and so forth, really, there's no city ordinances. There's no homeowners association. So you tend to have a lot more, you know, randomness and, and, and messiness in people's yard. That's not the same if you're in the suburban sites. Suburban sites, they tend to have a lot more ordinances. They tend to have a lot more homeowner associations that tend to keep people in line, okay? So context matters. And therefore, you know, I now if you look at the total diversity, the total diversity inside the city, regardless of what you what you have, is very high. Okay, and the abundances tend to be very high. So I'm not saying don't stop working in the city because we need you in the city, <laughs> but but yeah, the 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 effects in the exurban are the greatest. And, 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 you know, in, in the suburbs, that there might be a flip eventually if you get enough of the spillover effect. Okay. Oh. Okay, so let's go to the third kind, to the third crater. So this is the one that nobody wants, you know, around. Okay. But they're needed. Remember, mosquitoes serve as food items for a lot of birds. Uh, they tend to also uh, interact as larvae. They serve as larvae for a lot of other organisms. So they're part of the ecosystem. Now, there is, you know, the idea, of course, that, that mosquitoes do carry diseases. And we do know that they, you know, in this area, definitely you know, they're a major carrier of encephalitis. They're carriers of West Nile virus, which is, type of encephalitis. Uh, but, you know, there's also this mythology that if you have a lawn that have flowers and it has more of a natural appearance, that what you have is a mosquito producing environment. Okay. And the good answer, the good question that the good answer we have from you guys is that no, it's not. Okay. Uh, so providing suitable, safe, and healthy habitat is what we want to do. And, you know, mosquitoes are part of that. Wanted or not, they will be there. 
Okay. Uh, so that there are some species that are beneficial. There are also that are some detrimental. Okay. What we want to do is that if you have a diversity of mosquitoes, not all mosquitoes are going to be able to carry the same disease. And if you have a diversity of them, none of them will be abundant. None of them will dominate. So you can actually turn mosquito against mosquito and allow them to compete against each other. Okay. Now, St. Louis is a great place to study mosquitoes because we have a lot of them, especially the ones that are, you know, uh, pose a risk for human and animal disease. Okay. Uh, so the question is, does backyard conservation affect local diversity and abundance of mosquito control. Okay. So our working idea is that yes, it should increase diversity, but the abundances should not go up comparably. Okay. So you have the same amount of mosquitoes, but you have more different kinds. So any one species goes down. Okay. So that's the idea of natural biological control. So just uh, th so this is part of what we're talking to some of the people of public health. Uh, you know, if you, the main cause of mosquito abundances is water, you know, is habitat, water container. So if you clean your bird bath or, and, and make sure that your plant uh, trays and everything else is emptied after a big rain, you know, then you should be no problem. So for this case, we had we ended up with 42 homes. I think we uh, yeah we lost uh, a couple as you're gonna see in a second due to uh, the neighbors using pesticides. Mm -hmm. We use a gravity trap to uh, uh, get. Oh, hold on a second. It's not liking me. Give me a second because it's not enjoying uh some window. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's go back again. Uh huh. Okay, it's not. Okay, hold on a second. Oh, there we go. Now we did it. Let me go and share again. Okay, so we put. Uh, grab it traps. People remember these. They were pretty stinky because all the hay and, and the manure and whatnot that was meant to attract female mosquitoes. So we trapped those. We also got a bunch of the eggs back into the lab. They hatched. And so that's why we can identify the adults. And uh, needless to say, uh, just as we expected, well, that's statistically not significant. It goes in the right direction. The non-certified had five species, the silver, seven, and the gold had platinum. But the key here, notice the numbers, okay? The total abundances, once you divide by species, by location, and by certification level, the total abundance was not different, okay? The only thing we have to take with a grain of salt, okay, over here is that in a couple of the houses in the exurban site, one, uh, my grandson observed a neighbor house being sprayed extensively, <coughs> uh, you know, in the middle of the afternoon. So we have to be careful interpreting that this number may not be as low as, as, as we expect it to be, 
But in general, the trend holds very, very well. Bring conservation home does not in any way, shape or form enhances mosquito abundances. It's, it's not bring conservation homes are not the source of mosquitoes spreading through the neighborhood. Okay, so a well-maintained yard does not increase, you know, mosquitoes in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Uh, oh, now I'm not going to talk the dilution effect. Okay. So quickly, uh, let's wrap it up. So it is, it's, it's a very complex story, and I have just given you the 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 you know the proverbial tip of the iceberg for three separate groups, but all of these things are interacting in your backyard, okay? And it, one of the reasons is because it's a matter of scale, okay? You know, for a bee, you know, that kind of large tree abundances, complex canopy at very large scale really doesn't matter. That That is irrelevant to the bee, okay? They, many bees are, you know, less than half an inch long and they live in an area the size of your living room, okay? That, that's their entire world, okay? But for a bird, that is relevant. The, the, that scale matters a lot, okay? Alternatively, you know, in an urban environment, you know, that small of an area here, that's plenty for a bee, but that's irrelevant for a bird. Okay, so you're living and occupying two different worlds, but they tend to interact via intermediary species, <coughs> okay? And we know that there are many birds that are predators of bees. <coughs> so here's a great representative example. <coughs> oh, sorry, the allergies are killing me tonight. Awesome, you know, a pollination, a pollination biologist who has pollen allergies. Uh, but essentially, what is it that we're looking? We're looking at three small slices of a much broader ecosystem that is taking part in your backyard. And we're trying to ascertain, you know, how is that these arrows, what are the thickness of these arrows? How, you know, what's the directionality? How are things changing up and down as people's actions are occurring? You know, what happens if you mow? What happens if you don't mow? What happens if you fertilize? What if you don't fertilize? What happens if you plant natives? What happens if you don't plant natives? So we're trying to bring all these ideas into something that is comparable to what you see here. So the idea of maximizing this win-win situation, uh, it seems to work to a certain point, but not always. Okay? Because if all your neighbors are not interested in participating or are you know, working against you, that also has a spillover effect into your backyard as we saw with the mosquito spraying. So how we go from here? Well, this is the work with Dr. Uh, Laura Zwaron at uh, OMSL, in which we're interested in seeing how is that people's perception as well as people's ability, you know, yeah, you're part of the choir, but are you also preaching to the non-choir? You know, how is then that this perception of, uh, contributing to their environment, contributing to fighting the pollinator crisis, making a dent in biodiversity loss, you know, how all these various positive feelings may influence your ability to so-called spread the word, okay? So she will be building these social networks and these social networks, that depending upon the structure and how they operate, can be explained by one of three possibilities. One being social contagion, which is uh, communication driven. There's one that is called percolation theory, 
which is like what it sounds when you pour water through soil and it percolates. And this is mostly perception driven versus something called special entropy, which is wealth driven, you know, the so-called uh, uh, luxury effect of biodiversity. And not, these theories are not mutually exclusive of each other. That's a great thing about people that they can combine and work together and at times may work against each other. So that, that's the next set of goals that we have. And of course, ultimately what we want to do is to so-called strike that balance in which you have as small input as possible, yet you maximize diversity and maximize the ability of that system to persist. So with that said, I have, I want to thank all of you, Dan, awesome. Thank you, amigo. Greatly appreciate it. And, and first and foremost, we need to acknowledge Mitch who, you know, without him, this would not have started and who has provided a lot of feedback on our ideas and, and a great, awesome guy, as well as all our collaborators across the city and somewhere else. And uh, everywhere else, and, and of course, some of the uh, undergrads that have worked, and, you know, been in people's yards, and, and, and all of you for allowing us to, to pester and loiter in your yards <laughs> and, 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 and not kick us out of there, <laughs> although at times we, we might have deserved it. So uh, with that said, uh, yeah, muchas gracias. I'm still muted. Uh, thank you so much for that that presentation, uh, folks. We have um, we have a few minutes. If you have questions, uh, probably the simplest way uh, to get those answered would be to put those in the chat. Um, even with a, just a couple of dozen of folks in their space here, it's <laughs> if everyone unmutes and starts asking a question all at once. I can try, man. I can try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you have a question, go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I suppose I could ask one. Um, is there any, uh, and you maybe you don't have an answer for this, but is there any elements of the program that you identified to be like either more effective? These like, okay, these, these particular elements of the program is like build on that or were there elements is like, yeah, it doesn't seem to matter if you do well, that. It's, it's yeah, I mean, it has to deal with, you know, are you talking about the birds or the bees or the mosquitoes? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, uh, I mean, no, no, if answer, but, it, you know, it, it does seem, so it seems that if you are a bird, you know, if, you, if you're talking about birds and, you, you know, definitely being, you know, just like with the bees, you know, if you're in the uh, uh, rural exurban areas, you know, the moment you add any canopy structuring, boom, you know, the birds are there. You know, that, that if you're a bird. Uh, and if you're a bee and you're, again, in the exurban areas and you do a good solid planting of natives, bam. The bees are there. Well, a diversity of natives, then the bees are there. So it, it definitely seems that, you know, the biggest bank for the buck is there. Now, that's because the responses, you know, in that exurban areas, you, you have access to the species pool. You have access you know, you, you see like you're, you're, you're next to the bank, you know, you, you, you open an account, you, you walk there, there's the money. Okay. In the suburban areas, that's a problem. I mean, you, you can plant all you want and it doesn't matter how much you plant. The bees are not there, you know? And uh, so the question is, is, is going to be that it's like, you know, when is that the levy is going to break? You know, what, what is the needle that breaks the camel's back? You know, uh, the, the, you know, 
pick your cliche. You know, there, there's going to be a point in which people, you know, as you start increasing the diversity in the suburbs, then all of a sudden something breaks. Okay. And then you create the proper corridor and you create the proper attractant. And then you, you're going to get the bees starting to come in. Yeah. So, okay. he, it, so it's that, that so-called spillover effect that we need to identify what are the proper corridors to get biodiversity moving, you know, and colonize those sites. At the same time, I don't know if <coughs> planting a lot of natives and living habitat and whatnot matters if the bulk of your neighbors are, I mean, literally I, I was driving yesterday and there was this guy with the jug of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Roundup. And there's like these, these like teeny tiny weeds on a little crack on the sidewalk. And the guy had this intense look of I'm getting in. And he's just like squirting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna kill and you all. Like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was like, man, dude, you need a girlfriend. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, uh, we, uh, we it's Sunday, man. Grab a beer and watch some football. Yeah, it's time <laughs> to relax. Yeah, it's just it's just plants. It's okay. Uh, exactly but <laughs> but the look in his face i mean he was yeah. intense <laughs> how dare you grow where you're not supposed to exactly right? your little tiny weed <laughs> yeah so we have a question from lisa wilson who's one of our uh our oh, yeah. habitat advisors um uh who asks uh, how will the citizen science efforts such as shutter be contribute to your efforts uh, i think you have a very good oh question. yeah that lisa yeah I, uh, I mean, that's a whole other presentation. So yes, so we are, so sh the, the great thing about Shutterbee is that we have Shutterbee people that are BCH and we have non-BCH Shutterbee people. And, and we're visiting those people's yards too. Now, realize that if you're in part of Shutterbee, that means that you do have an interest. So it's, they're still part of the choir. Uh, but we are using that in order to see how can we use BCH data, what's happening at BCH, to predict what's happening at, non, at Shutterbee people that are non-BCH. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that, so now we're harnessing, you know, the, the 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 true power of science, which is our the ability to predict what's happening. Nice. So yeah, it's it's. I say uh, invite Nikki next time, and, and I bet Nikki will will love to talk about it. Um, and but that 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 does require. It's, it's a little bit more, it requires a bit more ecological theory because we're using it on using something called occupancy models. So if I know what are the things that, you know, based upon BCH, these are the things that if I have this combination of flowers and this combination of green space and this combination of temperature and nightlight radiance, and I get these bees, can I predict based upon that, you know, will the same bees occur under the same set of conditions over here? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so it's really great. And, and, and again, this is one thing could not be possible in any way, shape or form without BCH, but we're now talking, we're going into the deep end of ecological theory. We are at the real, cutting edge of being capable of predicting what's happening in the city and uh, and again yeah exactly it's uh, we we submitted a, a very large proposal to the national science foundation a couple of weeks back 
you know, with uh, Dr. Nicole Miller Strutman from Webster, Dr. Uh, Adam Smith from the Missouri Botanical Garden and myself to try to resolve that problem. So I say, Nikki will be the person to, and not, not, not to mention all the other great work that you guys have done uh, in order for us to understand how is that a whale oil mach machine in terms of citizen science should work. So that, that's also part of the study. Um, so there's another interesting question from, let's see, Beth uh, Camp asks, uh, can I do citizen science for my own use at my home, which is gold certified uh, for the B project since my rural site was not selected? Oh, of course, uh, they, they, they're great, you know, exactly. Contact Dan, Dan can give you my email and we are looking for Shutter B, uh, for a new class of Shutter B citizen science to join the project, yes. Good, I, I should probably put that out to all the folks. The yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, Chris uh, Gerhardt asks, in considering urban versus suburban, did you look at average lot size? Did you consider age of neighborhood or? Uh, ah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, there, all of that is there. I could not get into the minutia because as you can see, there's a lot of stuff over there. Yes. So when it comes to lot size, yes. Uh, the average lot size in the urban, you know, inside the city is the smallest. Suburban were in the middle and exurban tend to be larger. So uh, we standardize our sampling based upon the total amount of, uh, the, the total area of plantings that people had. Okay, so, so if you had a very small, you know, lot, we sample for like five minutes. And if you have a very large lot, then we sample for 20 minutes. And so we divided by the total amount of time that we were there. Now we are also using remote sensing and we have data from East West Gateway Council of Governments that has the lot size of all the properties. Okay. So that is built into the more refined analysis that, that we're carrying right now. But in general, the, the differences in sizes in lots were not enough for birds. Uh, and in general, I don't think there were enough for mosquitoes yet. There might influence a little bit the, bird, the bees, especially when you compare the urban and the rural sites. That's the only time where there might be a little bit of, a, of, a, of an issue. Age of neighborhood, extremely hard to, to sort out. So we stayed in lots that the neighborhoods were at least 30 years old. Okay. Yeah, okay. So we um, avoided the brand spanking new developments. We tried to, I think we did. <laughs> well, I'd be curious to see what, what kind of diversity we get there too. But oh yeah, no, yeah. that that would be a sad day. That that's that that would be sad. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the, the use that as your negative. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Gail has an interesting question. I don't know if we have an answer for this, but Gail has an interesting question about the availability of native plants uh, and how they might figure into all of this. So she says anecdotally. Oh, yeah. As she says, as I've visited with gardening friends in other parts of the country, I've seen far fewer native plants available in their local nurseries. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Oh, amen, amen. Yeah, that that's an issue. And and again, um, you know, there is native, and then there there there's native. You can talk about a plant that is native, in the sense that the species occur here but you may have what we call an ecotype. So if you, if you have a plant that comes from, it's native to the Missouri, St. Louis area, but you get it from somewhere in Louisiana or Mississippi, that subpopulation is adapted to the conditions down there. That's what we call an ecotype. So that, that matters a lot. 
Mm -hmm. And so when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that, and you get, you know, a purple cone flower, you have no freaking idea where that purple cone flower comes from. Okay, so that 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 matters too, you know. So you may be planting a purple cone flower that is an ecotype from North Carolina. You you don't know. So now in general, is that better than a begonia from Brazil? I think it's better than a begonia from Brazil. You mm -hmm. know, so you know, in general, I mean, we slew is a dreadful when it comes to the because slew love to plant tropicals, you know, in the summer. And you know, I I have put students to just sit in front of the tropicals, you know, like for hours and nothing lands on those tropical plants. I mean, like oh, uh -huh. yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> the, the you know, the flower flies or bees or beetles, they don't know what to make out of it. Mm. So so he's he's totally wasted. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess on a similar note, have you looked at, um, you know, cultivated uh, varieties versus like, so, you know, did they select? Well, I haven't. I, me personally, I have not. But yeah, other people have. And it depends. In some, sometimes, I mean, oh, well, no. I mean, we have looked at cultivated red buds. You know, some of the red buds in versus the wild. And we could not find any difference in terms of, alternatively, the dogwood, you know, some of the, the fancier, like the pink uh, uh, variety, some of the fancier varieties, yeah, you, you, you do have an effect. So it, it depends upon how different the cultivated is from the non-cultivated. I mean, we know that also for hibiscus, some of the... Uh, the, the cultivated, you know, some of the fancy, you know, some of the hibiscus looks like a pizza, you know, the, the size <laughs> of the flower. Yeah. You know, yeah, the, the, the hibiscus bee will want, I mean, it might as well be cardboard. You just, they, they don't care. <laughs> they, they, they will not visit it, you know, and they know what the rose mallow smells and tastes and whatnot. They, I mean, open a rose mallow, it's immediately there. Yeah. Offer one of the giant uh, 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 horticultural varieties. Don't touch it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, my grad student, my grad student was doing that experiment, and like, like after like doing it like ten times, she's like, "Should I keep doing this?" I said, "No, of course not. Differences are like completely. Uh, yeah, that's like you don't even need to do statistical analysis because." It's like, yeah, zero versus a hundred times. Like, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's obvious. If anyone asks for statistical analysis, they say, yeah, uh, 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 the, the person doesn't know statistics. That these are absolute differences. Nice. Um, so Dave Tilka, who is uh, one of the program's founders, by the way. Oh, yeah, a good friend and a good friend too. Yeah, so he's he's asking, have you considered more uh, uh, mobile invertebrate groups such as Lepidoptera for your study in addition to sedentary invertebrate bees? <laughs> hey, Dave. Yeah, no, uh, indeed. I, yes, we are looking now at uh, hoverflies, which did, you know, I'm also in, in the camp of they should not be called hoverflies. They should be called flowerflies. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm also uh, I'm, I'm trying to convince a colleague to look at ground spider diversity so you know the salticida the jumping spiders uh, so I think there is a whole host of other organisms that, that are making cities you know making a great living in the city and, and we don't know who are those and how many and how well are they doing? But in general, this, this idea that the city is, is a biological desert has to be set aside because uh, definitely a lot of things are, are, are here. Great. Well, that's probably a good place to, uh, to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. This is a really, 
uh, delight. I, I've been really looking forward to, to, to hearing all this. So uh, thanks for putting that together. No, no, my pleasure. My pleasure, amigo. All right. Have a great evening. Um, is let's see, uh, Amy or Dennis want to want to have any closing statements at all? I don't think I have anything else to add other than just thank you again. That was really really fantastic. Oh, my pleasure. Muchas gracias. Agree. Thank you all, and uh, and thanks everybody for joining in tonight. It's been a good group. We had about fifty people joining us. So uh, thank you, Gerardo, and uh, everyone else. Uh, have a pleasant evening. Good night. Good night. Adios. Bye, everyone.